you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, I want you to go ahead and open them up to Exodus chapter 19. So we've, we've covered 18 chapters so far, and as we continue our walk through the book of Exodus, the Israelites are now gathered at the base of Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, also called Mount Oreb in the Scriptures. And it's where the remainder of the book of Exodus, all of the book of Leviticus, and the first 10 chapters of Numbers are going to take place. And something very significant is going to take place in the next few chapters of Exodus. God is going to give the Ten Commandments, also called the Ten Words because of how they're written in Hebrew. God's going to give Moses the Ten Commandments and he's going to give them to his people. And these Ten Words form the foundation for the most influential religious document ever produced in the history of the world, the Mosaic Law. And we've been moving very quickly through our study of the book of Exodus this year, but now we're going to slow down a bit. And we're actually going to take 13 weeks to unpack the Ten Commandments because they reveal to us God's character. They reveal to us His expectations for how we're to relate to Him and how we're to relate to one another. And more importantly, the Ten Commandments actually reveal our need for the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. As we come to Exodus chapter 19, the Israelites are at a significant point in their journey to the promised land. They've experienced the high of God's victory over the Egyptians and the crossing of the Red Sea. They've experienced the hardship of a long, arduous walk across the desert wilderness where they were dependent upon God to provide food every single day and water every single day for them, for their families, for their animals. And they know that they're going to the land that God has promised them, but they're not there yet. And they want to enter the land and settle down, but they're not ready yet. See, God hasn't finished his work of preparing them for the promised land. The people of Israel first need to understand what it means to live in a covenant relationship with God. So begin reading Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says, on the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. And there Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel. Stop right here for a moment. So it's a new moon. That means it's a new month. It says on that day, that implies the first day of the month. So the first day of the third month, roughly two full months have passed since the exodus, since the parting of the Red Sea, since they came into the wilderness. So they've been walking for a while. And God instructs Moses to speak to the house of Jacob. Well, that, that's kind of new for some of us. What does that mean? Well, house of Jacob, that's actually a synonym for Israel. So if you've read the book of Genesis, you'll remember that there was a place in Genesis where Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And he wouldn't quit. He just kept wrestling with the Lord. And afterwards, God changed his name to Israel. The Israelites are Jacob's descendants. So as we continue, God starts by reminding the nation of something very significant. So what we're going to see in this passage of Scripture is we're going to see God providing clarity from what is going to be a giant cloud. And as he provides clarity, he's going to reveal to us, or he's going to remind us what he's done, he's going to reveal to us who he is and what he expects of us. And so he starts in this passage by reminding us what he has done. God has done the work of redemption for us. Look at verse 4. He says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So this is a reminder of God's sovereignty and justice. It's a picture of his love and mercy. 
In Deuteronomy 32, verses 9 through 11, uh, there Moses actually expounds on this word picture that God uses here. He says, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness, he encircled him, he cared for him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. So just as an eaglet in the nest is absolutely incapable of caring for itself, just as that eaglet is dependent upon its mother for food, for protection, for life itself, so too were the Israelites helpless while bound to the Egyptians in slavery. So too are the Israelites absolutely dependent upon the work of the Lord for their redemption and for their daily life. So the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, but God intervened and redeemed them for himself. And their salvation was entirely of grace. It was entirely undeserved, and it was entirely God's work. And so too is our redemption. Before he says anything else, God reminds Israel what he has done for them. He's done the work of redemption for them. By the way, that's what God's done for us as well. Now, if you spend any time with me, you've probably heard me say, well, I got saved when I was 17 years old. The truth is, I didn't do a whole lot, right? I got saved almost implies like I did something. But if I was using good grammar, I would say I was saved when I was 17 years old. Because mine was really a passive experience. I heard the gospel. I was confronted with my sin. I recognized I couldn't overcome my sin, couldn't save myself from my sin. And so I cried out to God and asked him to save me. God is the one who did the work of redemption. He's the one who gave his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross in my place. It's a gift of grace. Unmerited, undeserved. So as we see this description of how God has redeemed Israel, we're kind of reminded of the way that God has redeemed us. And so as God starts, he he just reminds them what he's done. This is the foundation of what's going to follow. And now God begins to clarify who he is. The first thing we see in this text is that God is loving This is shown in his redemptive love toward the Israelites. God is loving. Then even in verse 5, he says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Treasured possession. Basically, God's saying, you will be my own people, more precious to me than any other. There's a special love that God has with his covenant people that he doesn't share with the other peoples of the world. God loves everyone. But if you're here today and you're in Christ, God loves you in a way that he doesn't love those who don't follow him. He is loving. As we continue reading, we see a second, more significant character attribute of God, what many theologians call his chief attribute, which is holiness. God is holy holy. Why don't you think about this with me for a moment? You go to Isaiah 6 and you you read uh, this account of the throne room of God and you see the seraphim flying around the throne. What are they saying? They're saying God is love, love, love. No, they're saying God is holy, holy, holy. Not once, not twice, three times it's recorded for emphasis. Holiness is God's chief attribute, and this passage is really dedicated to helping the Israelites understand who God is. Verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So by the way, 
This is the only appropriate response to God. When God says you do something, you say, we'll do everything you say, Lord, right? The phrase no Lord is an oxymoron, okay? He's only Lord if you say yes. And a lot of, a lot of Christians struggle with this. A lot of people want to just kind of pick and choose the parts of the Bible they're going to obey. They want to pick and choose which commands, or which aspects of personal holiness they're going to be concerned with. That is not what God tells us to do. That is not what God expects us to do. He wants us to obey all of his law. Verse 9, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. And when Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So here we have this visible manifestation, visible and audible manifestation of the Lord's presence that's intended to remind the people that God is speaking through Moses and Moses is speaking to God for the people. He is their priest. It's a confirmation of Moses' appointment and his commissioning. This is a very significant moment in the life of the nation of Israel. But before God comes down to the people, before the people can even begin to approach God, what does he say? They must consecrate themselves. There has to be spiritual preparation. They have to be set apart. They have to be made holy. See, God is holy, and holiness is required to follow God. That's our big idea for the morning. If you're taking notes, write this down. Holiness is required to follow a holy God. So you have all the people, they're just going through their normal everyday life, and God says, I'm about to show up. Before anybody comes near me, they need to prepare themselves for when I show up. Verse 12, God says, And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. Literally, it says, Dying he shall be caused to die. The, the phrase is emphatic. Death is the penalty for violating the holiness of God. Say, man, that's a very Old Testament picture of God. Hey, let me remind you that Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, the penalty for sin is death. That's not just an Old Testament concept. God's holiness is unchanged. This mountain, when God descends upon it, is going to be treated like the holy of holies, the dwelling place of God. God continues, verse 13, no hand shall touch him. So the guy that touches the mountain, you're not even going to touch him. But he shall be stoned or shot, whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. Now, at this point, it's starting to get a little humorous for us and, and a little arduous for Moses because he goes up the mountain God tells him something, he comes down the mountain, he tells the people, he goes back up the mountain, tells God. He goes back down the mountain, tells the people. Now, Mount Sinai is 8,600 feet tall. Now, Moses is not going all the way up to the peak of the mountain because based on Exodus 3, we're assuming this is happening in the vicinity of where Moses got the burning bush experience, right? So maybe he's halfway up because there has to be trees and bushes growing and he was shepherding his sheep when he saw the burning bush. But even if he's only going halfway up, he is absolutely wearing out his sandals, going up, reporting, coming down, reporting over and over and over again on the same day. I cannot imagine this. I had to, I had to descend a few thousand feet on uh, the first day of my trip to the Grand Canyon last year, and it took me eight hours and I could barely walk the next day. I don't know how he's doing this. This is, this is just amazing, right? Up and down, up and down. Moses is getting worn out. Verse 15, and he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. 
Now, you could absolutely rip this verse from its context and um, get into all kinds of trouble, all right? So we, we want to interpret this in light of everything else that's been said thus far. So here's what God is commanding the Israelites to do. Wash your clothes and abstain from sexual intercourse. Now listen, it is not sinful for a husband and a wife to be intimate. Sex is one of God's good gifts to humanity. But in this instance, God is interrupting the normal patterns of their lives so they will focus on him. This is what you've been doing. This is how you've been living. But now you're about to approach the mountain of God. Now you're about to hear from God. So I'm going to disrupt your normal everyday patterns of life and you're going to focus on me. By the way, God's word teaches us to do this with Sabbath observance as well. It's why we observe the Lord's day. He interrupts our regular patterns of life so we can focus on him. This is what you normally do, God says, but when God visits, you approach God. When you approach God, preparation and holiness is required. Remember, holiness is required to follow a holy God. Verse 16, on the morning of the third day. So Moses has been going back and forth, back and forth. But now the people have consecrated themselves. They're at the base of the mountain. They're not touching the mountain but now they see something happening on the mountain. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. This is an awesome display of God's might and causes everybody to shake. God is to be feared. God is to be taken seriously. Folks, listen to me. This is not the man upstairs. I've never thrown a brick at my TV before, but there have been many occasions where I've wanted to. And most of them happened at an awards show on TV, like the Grammys or the Oscars, or at an a athletic awards ceremony or an interview where someone says, I just want to thank the man upstairs for letting me do this. I'm like, that is not who God is. God is nothing like you. He is nothing like me. This passage of Scripture reminds us of his transcendence and his holiness. God is to be taken seriously. Verse 17, then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. And the smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. So God's might is seen, and it's felt in an earthquake. And there's more confirmation that God speaks to and through Moses. He speaks to God. God answers with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up back to the top. And the Lord said to Moses, go down, back to the bottom, and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. This is a reminder that sinful people cannot come into the presence of the Lord. Verse 22, he says, And let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you yourself warned us saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. But the Lord said to him, go down and come up bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Now, if you have your Bible, underline that phrase, lest he break out against them. God will not tolerate sin in his presence. It doesn't matter who you are. Not even the priests could go on the mountain. Only those invited. It doesn't matter who you are. God defines who can come to him and who cannot. Even Moses, who was able to climb the mountain, 
still could not see God and live. God is loving. God is holy. As we reflect on this passage of Scripture, we see what God expects. You see, God's not only holy, He demands holiness from us. All these warnings about approaching the mountain were actually warnings about approaching God. You have to be holy to follow a holy God. And this is going to become even more explicit as we delve into the Ten Commandments because none of us keeps them perfectly. And God's expectation is that they will be kept in perfection. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. James chapter 2, verse 10. This is the New Testament. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Now, folks, that is not good news. God demands holiness of us. God demands perfect holiness of us, and yet none of us is holy. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to run to Jesus. See, this actually reveals the beauty of the gospel. The Bible teaches that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That our our very attempts at righteousness and holiness are like filthy rags. We can never earn or merit a right relationship with God. And God knows that. So at the appropriate time in human history, the Father sent the Son into the world. And the Bible teaches when Jesus took on human flesh and became man, he lived a perfect life. He never transgressed the law of God in word or thought or deed. That's why the Bible says he was without sin. Yet around the age of 33, Jesus Christ was arrested, tried, beaten, and sentenced to death, nailed to a cross. He died the death of a criminal, which was fitting because When he died, he died in your place and mine. And the Bible teaches that as Jesus Christ hung on the cross, the Father poured out all of the wrath he'd been storing up for sin, all the wrath that he had for all future sin. He poured it all out onto the shoulders of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then three days later, to show that he'd accepted the sacrifice of Jesus, to show that he had the power over life and death, to show that we could believe everything he ever said, the Father raised the Son from the grave and he walked forward. And the Bible teaches that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you're saved, something very significant happens. God takes your sin, lays it on the shoulders of Jesus Christ, And then God takes the righteousness, the holiness of Jesus Christ and applies it to your account. This great exchange takes place. My sin becomes his. His righteousness becomes mine. All by grace through faith. And at that moment positionally, what's true of Jesus is true of me. What the Father says of the Son, he now says of me, this is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. Pleased because of what I've done? No. Pleased because of what Jesus has done. God demands perfect holiness, but I am far from perfect. How can I have perfect holiness? Only by resting in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can only be perfect if I'm hidden in Christ who was perfect. But once I'm clothed with the righteousness of Christ, that absolutely changes the way I view and relate to God. The fear of approaching God is gone. 
That's why in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, as the author of Hebrews writes to Christians, men and women who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because we've been redeemed by God, because our sin has been atoned for, because we have the righteousness of Christ, we can rush into the presence of God with confidence, not fearful of death, not fearful that we'll be turned away, but confident that we will be accepted as a father accepts a child. My kids grew up in church. Dad was always the pastor, not exactly the the greatest thing to have uh, be the case. But, you know, a lot of times they wanted mom and dad, you know, they wanted to talk to dad, but I would be counseling someone. I would be meeting with someone before church, after church. Sometimes Marcy would forget to take the kids home and, you know, I'm joking. It only happened once, but we remember. (laughs) And so, you know, the kids are waiting outside my office to get done so I can give them a ride home from church, right? Well, we had this rule. When I, whenever I meet with someone, I'll, I'll close the door so people can't hear what we're talking about. But I always told my kids, that door never applies to you. If that door is shut, you can burst right into my office. You always have immediate access to your father. And I did that just as a life lesson to teach them that they always have immediate access to their heavenly father. And I just told people when we started meetings, I was like, listen, no one's going to interrupt us, but my kids might. And my daughter would run in. If she knew there was chocolate on my desk, she had no qualms interrupting our meeting to get a piece of chocolate. And I didn't care because she was my little girl. But, but that's, that's what the blood of Jesus Christ does for us. It stays the wrath of God. It means we're accepted by God. And so we receive the holiness of Jesus Christ by faith. Then we pursue holiness as we learn God's will and seek to follow him in faith and obedience. Notice what they said in verse 5. What do the people say? All the Lord has spoken, we will do. God still demands that of all of us. We're saved, we have the righteousness of Christ, but we still pursue righteousness. We're saved, we have the holiness of Christ, but we still pursue personal holiness. We're concerned with obedience, and we do it not to merit a right relationship with God. That's legalism. And legalism kills. Legalism absolutely destroys. So if you you look at the commands of God and think, if I just obey them a little better, if I just try a little harder, God's going to accept me, eventually you're going to fail. If you're trying to live life on the treadmill where you're working really hard to earn God's merit, guess what? The treadmill always wins. So we don't, we don't obey to earn God's favor, to merit a right relationship with God. We don't obey so God will accept us because God has never accepted us on the basis of our successes and failures. He accepts us on the basis of Christ's work upon the cross and our faith in that finished work. We don't obey to be accepted. We obey because we're accepted. By the way, that's why that therefore is there in verse 5. Before God makes the first demand of the Israelites, he reminds them that he has saved them. So we look at this text, we see God's expectations. Number one, he demands holiness. We need the holiness of Christ. And because we have the holiness of Christ, we pursue personal holiness. We try to live lives that bring him glory. But in addition to that, he gives us a mission. Look again at verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A holy nation, a nation set apart because of its special relationship with the Lord. A kingdom of priests, a kingdom fulfilling a priestly function in the world, worshiping God, representing God to the people by revealing his power and will to the world around them. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, this is the only time this phrase is used in the Old Testament in this way. 
but it's picked up in the New Testament and applied directly to the church. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is what it means to live as a holy nation in a kingdom of priests. We image God to the world around us. The lost and dying world should be able to look at us and how we live our lives and how we glorify God and how we proclaim his excellencies and understand how to follow God and what it means to follow God. So we are all called, every single one of us, to live with a priestly function in the world around us, pointing those who are far from God to the God who saves. In this passage of Scripture, we see what God has done. We see who God is. We see what God expects. He expects holiness. He expects missional living. So what are our next steps? What are we supposed to do in light of this text? The answer to that is rest and pursue. Rest and pursue. Step one, rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The only reason God accepts any of us is because of what Jesus Christ has done. Listen, there are going to be times in your life when the enemy, the great accuser, is pointing out all of your failures. There are going to be times when your friends or your family or the world points out all of your failures. There are times in my own life when my own heart's pointing out all of my failures. And in those moments, I have to remind myself that God loves me. And that God has never accepted me on the basis of what I've done, but purely on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God is thrilled with me, overjoyed with me because of what Jesus did. And the same thing is true for you today if you are trusting in Christ as your Lord and Savior. So before you do anything else, you've got to learn to rest in the righteousness of Christ. Be freed from the pressure of trying to live up to an ideal you've never lived up to in your entire life. Just rest in God's love for you his provision for you, his grace and his mercy. Oh, but as we rest, we pursue. We pursue personal holiness. We pursue God's design for our lives. See, even though I am declared holy the moment I'm saved, there's a lot of me that isn't holy yet. God saved me, but he's, on in this, he's in this process of making me more like Jesus. It's called the process of sanctification. So one of the things we ask ourselves over and over here at First Baptist Middleburg is what? Do I look more like Jesus today than I did this time last year? Right? So that, that process of learning to look more like Jesus... It's the process of pursuing God's design for our lives. It's the process of pursuing personal holiness. And even though we've been declared righteous by God, we're still chasing after God's design, striving to be the person that he wants us to be. And understanding that absolutely changes the way we view the law, changes the way we view the commands of God. Now, I've I've, I've shared this before, but can you imagine if you were about to get in a swimming pool It's the middle of the summer, it's hot, you can't wait to jump into the cooling waters of this beautiful pool. And right as you get to the edge, there you see this big sign that says, no swimming. 
most of us are going, well, that's the man trying to rob me of my joy, trying to keep me from enjoying all that this beautiful pool has to offer. But if we know the pool actually has high levels of acid in it, where it's been shocked and that acid's going to burn us or poison us or there's something else wrong with the pool. Is that sign there to steal our joy or is that sign there to save our lives? Signs there to save our lives. Perspective changes how we view that sign. See, for those who are resting in the righteousness of Christ, we understand God's will, God's word. It's not God trying to rob us of our joy. It's God trying to save us from the world, save us from ourselves. It's God revealing the very best way to live. The way that's going to bring us the most joy, the most happiness. And it's going to make us the most like Jesus Christ, which ultimately is what we want more than anything else. So we rest in the righteousness of Christ and we pursue personal holiness. We pursue the commands of God because I will never be happier than when my life is aligned with God's design. Just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song of response. And as we do, if you're here this morning, and there's never been a time in your life when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to remind you, the Bible says today can be the day of your salvation. Maybe you're here this morning, you're, you're trusting in Jesus Christ, but you've never professed that faith through believer's baptism. Today, you need to talk to someone about baptism. Or there's something else going on in your life, you know you need to bring your life in alignment with God's design. Whatever God's calling you to do today, the only appropriate response is to say, yes, Lord, we will do all that you've commanded us. Let me pray for you and we'll respond. Father, we love you and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for this opportunity to gather this morning. And Lord, I pray as we worship that you would Impact our hearts with the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Empower us to say yes to all that you've commanded. And help us take the first step in living a life that brings you glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me?